Kids still here? Oh, there they are again. She did it again. <laughs> okay, so who's with you today? Beth? Oh. They voted that you were with them today. I don't know if that's true or not, but I think so, yes. They really, really like you, I think. Sure, kind of. Mostly. No, you're not. <laughs> you used to color in church. Nope. Now you got to be in here with me. Okay, why are you still here? Go! Shoot. Feed them sugar, for Lord's sake. No, don't. Yeah, we can feed them sugar and then send them home. Huh? Yeah, with daddy. This is hidden. And I got, oh, my gosh. Who did that? This had to be Brenda. Brenda, did you do that? I honestly do not own one. I honestly don't. I do not. I don't know who did it. Did you do it? No? No. I think Brenda did it. No? You'd have got me two. Oh, 42. <laughs> Man, this one's too big. Fine, we'll go to the first hole. Don't ever let anybody say Beach Baptist isn't a peculiar bunch. <laughs> you are. Okay, so it's just going to get more peculiar from here. I'm just going to tell you. Because, listen, I, I honestly didn't want to do it today. I'm, I'm going to do it. This, and can you all see that? Oh, you can see that. Good. This came across just my path about Monday. And I was like, oh, that'd be a cool screensaver. I've got to have that. So I just took it off the internet, it was just a picture. Well, then come to find out, um, Sean is um, a little mini movie. Uh, so I contacted some pastor friends of mine, and it's actually a Father's Day thing. Um, so we're going to watch a movie on Sunday morning. It's, it's short. I mean, it's not like a pulling movie. We didn't bring popcorn, so don't get excited. So the, but the lion's share of this morning will be this. And then I've got, there, there's some stuff to go with it. And honestly, we're going to look at this probably for a while. Um, and I didn't create any of it. I'm just going to jump in on it with these guys that have already created it and set it up. And thinking about Father's Day. So it's a Father's Day thing. But it's also a prodigal thing. Um, and so we're going to look at the aspect of fathers, how you love prodigals and and what that says about you and your relationship with God do y'all know what a prodigal is anybody know the definition of prodigal hmm mm -mm. Mm -mm. runner uh-uh no a prodigal mean prodigal the word prodigal means wasteful that's what it means you, you and I, because of the prodigal son's story, it's all about the returning. So we, we talk about a prodigal as one who's gone and, and come back. But a prodigal is someone who's wasteful with what they've been given by their father. Ooh. Um, so let's just, let's just. Clear that all off and throw that up there. Um, Sean Taylor, can you just turn all the lights down? We're going to pray that technology plays with us well today. And you let this absorb. Let this absorb. I, I watched it last night. It's just 
Pretty cool. You'll all know it's a true story. True story. Sean, let me see. Look up. Look straight at me, Sean. Let's see if I can see any of that. Let's see a big smile, Sean. This big crowd mostly in blue, and he swings. It's a high fly ball to deep left field. It is a way out and gone. And the Dodgers win a big game. The Dodgers have made another move today in their roller coaster season. Well, after a year of instability, both on and off the field, the Fox Group finally got something right in the front office. And today, the Dodgers hired former Orioles assistant general manager Kevin Malone. The 71-year-old Lasorda says the GM job is for a younger man. My wife felt that uh, I should uh, <clears throat> not be doing it, so I'm handing the baton to uh, Kevin. <laughs> Go, Sean! Run, run, run! As Tommy would say, I feel truly blessed to be a Los Angeles Dodger. Kevin became uh, general manager of the Dodgers in August 1998. He was gone probably 250, 270 days out of the year and worked overtime and, you know, family became second. It's difficult because you're alone a lot. I would have liked to have someone around. I was lonely and I was raising two kids by myself. As far as interacting, you know, on a daily basis with the kids, he wasn't, he wasn't there. Sean growing up was, um, was an amazing kid. He was funny, uh, fun-loving. Uh, Sean and I were not that close growing up. I feel like we were always around hanging out, but on a deeper level, I didn't really know him as well as I should. When I first met him, he, he was innocent. You know, he had, he had not got that far. Um, but you could tell that there was something he was searching. There was something he, he was looking for. I think we were really close, especially with Kevin being on the road a lot. We kind of were alone a lot. He did karate. He did um, basketball, football, golf. He did all the different sports. He enjoyed them. To be completely honest, what it was like when Sean was born was I was basically focused on other things. I had things to do. I had players to scout. I had a team to help win a championship. I felt like uh, there was more important things. Unfortunately, it, when I say that now, it makes me sick to my stomach. I think back about being gone all the time and really not thinking much about it, thinking I was a good father because I was providing and giving them all the things that they wanted. I didn't realize until much later that what they wanted was me. Sean hid his lifestyle very well. Um, it wasn't until the very end when things started, you know, becoming more noticeable. Sean started getting into drugs probably in high school. And I knew he was up to something. I think the norm for most people is to start exploring uh, with substances and alcohol. There's a lot of pressure to, you know, fit in, but I think overall the norm is to start dabbling and start experimenting and just kind of see what else is out there beyond the family household. When he got to USC, it was full-blown chaos. These are kids that had resources, had money, they had all the drugs, all the alcohol, so it escalated. How can we just do anything to not be with ourselves? Because I'm not comfortable just being, you know, me. The more that you do this, the greater your tolerance gets. And so that means you have to take more and more in order to achieve the same desired effect. That's why it's so dangerous is because you're chasing a feeling. And, and I believe that the, the feeling that you're chasing is actually you're seeking a spiritual experience. There's got to be something more going on. I don't think Kevin wanted to talk because you know, it's, I'm guessing that's my words, but there, there has to be some shame. Um, I know in my friendship with Kevin, I, I know how much he cared about Sean. And I know how much he, uh, how much he loved him, how guilty he felt being gone when he was in baseball. And uh, 
I'm sure he put a lot of the blame on himself, the fact uh, that he was struggling with an addiction and, and, and didn't want anybody to know. Maybe me being gone so much created a, a loneliness or a void in his life that I wasn't uh, the father that he needed. He totaled four cars uh, in the span of about four, five years maybe, but never had a scratch on him. So he felt he was invincible, which is part of the problem with him. Being like me, living on the edge, feeling he was invincible, he was living like he didn't care if he died or not. Santa Monica and um, I knew Sean had taken some drugs and I didn't want him driving because I didn't want him to hurt anybody else and so he quickly grabbed the keys and started to run out of the house and Kevin ran after him. I knew he had some drugs on him but I knew he had a lot of drugs in his car and he was leaving and I, w I wasn't ready to deal with that. He runs out the door and he's, he grabbed his keys and I knew he was taking off so I chased him out outside on the driveway I said, give me those keys, give me the drugs if you've got any on you. And we wrestled, and it was wrestling back and forth, and he ended up throwing me on the ground. It was horrible, because Kevin came in crying, because he didn't, couldn't believe Sean would do that to him, would, you know, just push him aside like that. And, and go on for drugs. I was on my way to, to England, and so I got a call from mom. She said, hey, Peter, you need to come and say goodbye to Sean. We don't know if he'll make it through the night. So I, I flew back, uh, and I went to the hospital. And um, he was at St. John's. Um, and he was just, you know, gone in some way. I I'll never forget walking into the room and, and seeing Sean laying in the bed with, with the tubes and, and lifeless. I believe they said once I got there that, you know, he had done drugs and he was unconscious and not breathing for a long time, so that there was a loss of oxygen to his brain. They told me, you know, that Sean uh, probably's not gonna make it. When I first saw Sean in the hospital, it's one of those things as a dad where I've got my little girl with me and my first thought is, Wow, was she ready to see this? I didn't realize it was gonna look this bad. I wanted to cry. It was just so weird. I didn't, I wasn't used to that. When I saw him, it was just like, looked like he was dead. So I went out into the waiting room and just started praying. I started calling every man of God, woman of God I knew, texting, emailing, pray for my son. The words were that we don't think he's gonna make it. Something's wrong, he's dying, everything's shutting down. He's got pneumonia, all his vitals, they're, 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 they're shutting down. We don't think we can save him. We don't know what's gonna happen. It doesn't look good. So I'm not gonna stay in there and watch him die. It was kind of surreal in that I was doing something I had, had assumed at one point I'd have to do. These are MRIs obtained on Sean from July 6, 2013 at St. John's Hospital. So these are all little strokes in his brain. These changes are consistent with what we would call an anoxic brain injury. At the time Sean was in the hospital, he was the USC that kid that overdosed. And across the hallway, there was a UCLA kid that had overdosed. And um, it's unpleasant. When patients die, I don't sleep that night. When we had 
admitted Sean almost 30 days after his injury, he was still in a state of profound impaired consciousness. And he was completely paralyzed. He was 100% dependent on others for his care. At first, you just kind of go blank when they tell you that, that your son is gone. And my thought was, he doesn't know the Lord. I can't imagine my son in hell. I mean, that's what really broke my heart, was that there was no hope for him if he couldn't come out of that. So my prayer then became, God, if he knows you, take him home. If he doesn't know you, I want a full miracle. I, I need, I need this. Uh, the doctors were telling us, we don't think he's gonna make it. He could wake up and he'd be a vegetable, um, and that Sean wouldn't want to live like this. You know, it's best after 30 days to pull the plug on him. So that was, that was really tough. Unfortunately, when your life changes in a moment, the grief is unimaginable. 22 years old, it's just too young to die. And he's As a pastor, I felt like I was doing a funeral every month at least, um, sometimes several, because <coughs> things just end suddenly, unexpectedly. I couldn't understand why, why God could do, uh, do that. Uh, you knew there was, there was something I had for him, but all of a sudden, you saw the end just right there in front of you. And that was really difficult uh, for me and to watch family uh, that you'd known that protected him, that loved him that much, uh, that they had come to the end of his life. Sean, let me see, look up. Look straight at me, Sean. Let's see if I can see any of that. Let's see a big smile, Sean. I remember Kevin praying that evening and we're beside his bed. There was, there was a, a tear that, that came out of, of Sean's eye. Now, you have to understand, he's lifeless. The doctors are saying he's brain dead. There, there is, there's nothing there. He's, he's gone. He started crying, and it was weird. I, I thought he wasn't supposed to do anything. Then all of a sudden, the tears were coming out of his eyes, and I was just like, any, any, uh, any cough, any blinking of the eye, you know, there's textbooks that are gonna say it's just, it's just reactionary. I felt that evening he was, he was communicating to his dad because his dad was so broken and he loved him so, so much. And he was just crying out, just saying, God, just save my son. Just, just, just save my son. There was a tech in there with Sean. They would talk to him just like he was, you know, there and able to speak back. And that's what happened. He spoke back to her, scared her to death. straight A's and doing drugs at the same time. 
My parents said I was in a coma for two months. I didn't think I was broken, but I was back in the day. I thought there was a God, but I didn't have a relationship with him. There's many wonderful people that we know that have lost their children to drugs. Um, so are we deserving? No. God just um, blessed our life to give us Sean back. I saw him literally going, going. All I could hear were machines. And to see him smile, walk, finish school, and go to church with us, I can't believe that he's here. I want to say thank you for my dad saving me when I was not breathing and my mom for fighting so hard to, to just be with me every day. Amazing. What would you have done if I died? I probably would have died too. You know, the physical story of Sean is great, but I, I think the spiritual story is so much greater and, and way, way more important um, because we're all gonna die. That's a guarantee. Now, spiritual life isn't a guarantee because once you die, it's over. The question is, is what comes after? And can you be sure of that? Did you see heaven? No, I did not. That would've been cool to see it, though, <laughs> but I didn't. Well, a lot of people um, want to know what he saw in the coma or if he saw God or if he went to heaven. And... Really, Sean saw nothing. God came down to Sean. I was in the hospital. I was with my dad. And then I asked for forgiveness of my sins and asked Jesus Christ to come to my life. I was so close. God was amazing. That was like, he was my friend. Jesus is so different from all these other gods or religions. Um, one, the fact that he reached down and lowered himself and suffered for my sake. And the other big one is that he says, I'm gonna die and I'm gonna rise from the dead. And then he pulled it off. And you think about the disciples who, I mean, they, they ran away when he was crucified. But then when they saw that he literally rose from the dead, now suddenly these men are filled with this courage, like he really does have power over death. So I, so it's great that Sean's walking around laughing, uh, but it's far, far more important to me that he knows God now and he's gonna be with him forever. You know, from what happens from here on in is, is fine with me. I can deal with, because I know where he's going. I never thought we'd be doing this a year and a half, two years ago. Yep. I thank God that we uh, can play catch again. Yeah. Right here. I just didn't think I could do that any better. So we're going to share the story th this morning. All we're going to do is read the prodigal son story, but we're going to look at it from the perspective of, of the wasteful part, uh, of the wasteful of what God's given you. And then we're going to come back a couple of weeks probably and, and really tear it apart and go at it from the perspective of loving the prodigal. And, and it's some in there about uh, how God loves you even though you waste it, even though you're wasteful, even though you turn away, how, where he is with you. But more importantly, how you, you yourself, love a prodigal.
and reflective of how others have loved you while you're a prodigal. Um, really put an emphasis on this relationship stuff that God is so important in his heart about. Um, let's just read that story. It's John chapter, I oh, forgot. No, Luke 15, 15, 11 to 24. We did John in Sunday school. So. I just want to read the story and then we'll, we're going to dismiss. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven, against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. So many times I've read that story and, and I, focus, I, I focus on the return. I focus on the coming to the senses. Do you not? And, and we, we do celebrate just like he said when that return happens. But I want us to think about what's happening while the son's gone. I want us to focus on what the father feels while the son's not there. While the son is in wild living, while the son has spent his inheritance, while the son, I want to focus on that. And it's all in there. The story tells us what happens while the son's away. It shows us the father's heart. And it shows us some attitudes, but you've got to look at it pretty deep. You've got to study it at some. And, and that's kind of what I've been doing with this story. So I want us to do that. We're going to peel it apart over the coming weeks. We're going to look at wasteful living. And you'll find it has hardly anything to do with here on the planet and what you do with your stuff. It, it's in there, but not near as much. It's what it is to what you've done with what God has given you in His Son. The gift that that is, and what that looks like as we walk around, and what it feels like and what it is to love prodigals, to love them. Because... In that love shows the world your love for the Father. How you love prodigals shows the world your love for God inside you. And that's what's really important. Uh, if you want to go and check that out, you can, goo uh, you can Google Sean the story or Acapella Films, I think it was called. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff out there that, that talks about it and tells you more of their story. Um, but that, that, that prodigal story part, you heard it, it wasn't just about the return. It was about what he found while he was gone and how the father was while he was gone. And that's what we're going to look at. Stand with me and we will go. Bible study this Wednesday, 530, over in the retreat center back behind us. Um, if you uh, want to uh, come have dinner with us. That starts at 5.30. Bible studies at 6.15.
Uh, and then in the bulletin, anything that's going on this week while you're in town, you're here with us, your family, we want you to be a part of it. May you celebrate Father's Day today. If Father's not here, make sure you call him, text him. Uh, if he's gone, maybe there's another father figure on the planet that you look up to. Call them, get a hold of them today, and tell them Happy Father's Day. Oh, so we're up here Wednesday night, sorry. So we're in this building Wednesday night, 530. Right, Mary? Make boo-boo, 530. Uh, there was something else I was supposed to tell you. Does anybody remember what it was? Happy Father's Day, Christopher. Thank you, Christopher. That wasn't it, but thank you. I don't remember what it was. All right, anyway. Oh, oh, I don't know what it was. If, you're, if your dad's not here, your husband's not here, Johnette's going to put some gifts together for the kids. Uh, if you'll just see, are you going to go back there or, or there? There's a room right there called room number, yeah, I'm going to pretend to read that, six. Room to six. If you go to room six, Miss Johnette, she'll send you home with one of our Father's Day gifts. If you want to take it to somebody who's not here, we want you to do that. Uh, there are plenty for you to do that uh, and take it uh, and celebrate Father's Day with them. And, and, and you can even tell them it's from you. We don't care. You can say, hey, I got your Father's Day present. It looks like 100 other people's Father's Day presents, but that's okay. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't matter. May God truly bless you as you walk out these doors with the spirit that's inside of you and the mission he has for you to be on uh, as you go away. Be in tune to what he has. Curtis, would you pray for us?